Well, hello again, and welcome to another edition of Mastermind Minutes. My name is Gary Occhigrosso. I'm the managing partner of Franchise Growth Solutions, as well as the publisher of FranchiseMoneyMaker.com. And for those of you who are new to Mastermind Minutes, it's a very simple concept. We have one guest, we ask one question, and we get one expert answer. And today, my guest is Bob Ray. Uh, who has been with the Margarita's Mexican restaurant chain since 1992. Uh, he moved from being a, a manager to a director of food and beverage in 1995, and then he progressed through multiple roles, including vice president of new restaurant openings and vice president of operations, as well as director of human resources. So we're going to be speaking with, uh, with someone who's really done it all in in the restaurant business. Now in the spring of 2020, we all remember where we were in the spring of 2020, Ray became uh, not only an owner, but also a board member uh, and assumed the role of chief operating officer for the company. Um, so Bob, uh, thank you for being with us here today. Um, perhaps you wanna fill in a little bit more blank, uh, blanks of, about your background and tell us a little bit more about margaritas and then we'll get to our one question. Yeah, thank, thanks, Gary. Happy to be here. Um, yeah, my my background, um, the benefit of of joining the company early on um, and doing a lot of different roles was it was a growing company, so we were kind of hands on and everything and learning as we went, opening restaurants um, and evolving. And uh, I worked pretty closely with the founders through those early years, um, really establishing a common vision about about what makes margaritas great and you know it's about about a few different things but most of all about the people and how how we put teams together and how that translates down to the front line to create experiences um and then of course you know the margarita is a pretty important part of that formula as well uh so fast forward to um we had all of our restaurants shut down you know in march of of 2020, um, we didn't know where we were headed. Um, but again, kind of, I've been back, I had left the company for a couple of years. I've been back in the director of human resources role and um, working pretty closely with John Pelletier at that point, he had been directly leading the organization. And um, at that point, um, we had some time to reflect on, on what the opportunity was in coming out of the pandemic um, as we decided to reopen restaurants. Um, we both had that experience of the early years where we were one show a day, very focused, um, um, opening only for evening business, staying open late and focused on margarita sales and just really throwing a party for people every day. Um, and that kind of, that was part of our guidance on how to, how to step back into things. We knew we're, we didn't know what sales volume would be like. We knew we were going to do it with more focused teams. We wanted to make things more efficient and we took the opportunity to, to restructure how, how the menu looked, how it affected labor because we do have primarily scratch kitchens. We're making almost everything. Um, so it was sort of a reset for us that had some advantages. We didn't know it at the time. Right. But, well, listen, none of us knew it at the time. Um, and uh, again, uh, just, to clarify, how how many how many uh, restaurants do you have system wide, and how many are company, and how many are franchise? Sure. Yeah. Um, so there are twenty five units total. Uh, Eighteen are, are company restaurants. So we have a couple of franchisees, one in Pennsylvania and one in New Jersey, and then we have a franchisee in Maine with a couple of units who was a former manager of ours, who Very spun cool. one off, and then he's opened a second unit. Good. That's great. That's great to know. So, uh, as you know, I mean, my the pond that I swim in is franchising and restaurants. So I'm I'm always eager to know about you know franchise chains. And I think I mentioned to you before we went on the air that uh, down down on the Jersey Shore, I, I drive right past the Margaritas on the way to my my house down there. Um, you know, there's been we've had so many guests on in the last you know almost two years at this point. Um, you know, and, and obviously it's unavoidable to 
to you know not discuss COVID and what people have been doing during COVID and after and and everything else. And sometimes, quite honestly, I just you know I get I get bored with it and I get tired of talking about it. However, that being said, you know there there have been a lot of a lot of um, innovative um, techniques, methods, things that have come out of COVID, and I guess all by necessity uh, because we had to survive. But there have been things that I've spoken with uh, CEOs of companies and COOs of companies where now that they've gotten involved in those things, whether it's third-party ordering or having an app or online ordering, which pre-pandemic they didn't, they weren't involved with, and now they are. That's just an example that there are things that they've done through the pandemic that now they go, oh, wait a minute, that's a good idea. Menu engineering or you alluded to, you know, a one day part or, you know, bumping up, bumping up uh, in your case, you're doing margaritas. So that's, you know, that's a high profit item. So I guess for our question today, maybe you want to talk a little bit about and and, and, and I think you have a unique perspective. Let me just take a step back before I ask the question. The unique perspective is that you've been with the company in sort of ever increasing roles. And then you jumped in as COO, sort of right at the, the crest of the pandemic. You said March of 2020, you know, it seems like you probably just took the position and things happened. Um, so what I what I'd really like to know is when you got into that seat and you and you got your team around you, what were the things that you did immediately and now think, hey, those are good ideas, even as we're coming out of the pandemic, let's keep doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually, here's a pandemic. There you go. <laughs> didn't I didn't come into the role beforehand. So, but it was that was one of one of the important things that we did. Um, not about the actual approach to running the restaurants, but the overview was it, it was a lot of what we did was about having the right people in the right roles. And so so when I stepped into that day-to-day -day leadership role with the organization, um, the part of what happened in the last year and a half is John Pelletier. Who, ha who had been in that seat um, was allowed to focus on things that are really his specialty regarding the brand and, and some, some vision pieces. And we worked together, especially through that first summer, talking about what it should look like moving forward and who was going to do what. So on the leadership side, that reset, same, same people, different seats, kind of setting up for success. On the operating side, it was critical to us that we had um, people that were engaged in taking this, this, this um, venture forward with, a, with a, a little bit of a shift in focus. And this going from a company where a lot of the locations did lunch and dinner, there wasn't as much late night business, we needed to shift and focus on our operators, our managers, that were behind building the business in the evenings, that that lifestyle fit for them, um, that that really could grasp and execute a shift in the labor matrix because, you know, the, the bottom line is we were trying to rework it in a way where it was going to be more profitable as well. And the opportunities were in labor and cost of goods. So, in shifting to focus to late night and lining up all of our talent up around that day part, dinner and, and later evening, late night sales, um, we got our best people focused on the times when we had the most guests in the building and we consolidated our back of house labor in a way that has significant impact on our overall labor costs. In conjunction with that, um, one, of the, one of the big changes was we were doing a lot of discounting activity prior to the pandemic. And we, we reset on that side um, and all of that kind of fed into a pretty good shift on the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So the, the model really, it really was back to what I first learned when I joined the organization in, in the early nineties is this one show a day throwing a great experience for, for guests. And we have people coming in for a lot of different experiences. We have separate dining room and bar and lounge. We do families. We do a lot of celebrations. 
Um, we do uh, date night, you know, out for drinks with friends. We cover it all. Um, we we um, really focused on just being ready to execute those experiences. A lot of them involve a margarita, and that's that's a real core piece for us. Um, it, it seems to have, help everybody have a good time. Um, and all of the all this focus um, has helped us grow sales in like day parts. Even with taking out the lunch, we we've held our, our sales line compared back to 19. Um, and, and we feel like we've created a foundation that's going to work really well as, as we now shift our outlook and look to grow on both sides. We're, we're considering sites for company locations and also looking you know, to ramp up our, our franchise side activity. Well, I can tell you, it's interesting what you say because, uh, again, a lot of restaurateurs that I speak with, a lot of C-level executives that I speak with, it, it, it's interesting. So we need things like, you know, the great recessions and pandemics to take us sort of back to basics to what like really made the concept successful to begin with before we started doing all these add-ons. Uh, yeah. And it sounds like you were doing some of that. And but by the way, every brand I speak with, that just seems to be, hey, if we can do this, we should be able to do that and this, that, and the other thing. And before you know it, you're doing so many things that, you know, maybe in good times you can, you think it's all working, but then all of a sudden, like I said, you have a pandemic or a great recession, you go, wait a minute, let's pull this all back. Let's, as you said, you dropped your lunch, you went, you, you know, you went to a, a, a more consolidated menu, you focused on margaritas, because you are margaritas, uh, you focused on the guest experience, throwing the party, so to speak. So to a certain extent, you, you went back to basics. And I've, I've heard that a lot. What I've also heard is that going back to basics, but basics now are refreshed and they're modernized and they're forward thinking. So it's not like you're going backwards because when people, sometimes when people say, well, we're gonna, gonna go back to basics, that to me means, oh, wait a minute. So you're afraid of the future, so you're going backwards. But in this case, what I've heard you say and what I've heard a lot of other folks say is no. What we've done is, We've gone back to sort of the core value of what the brand stood for and stands for. And we've now feathered in some of the things that exist today that didn't exist back then. Things like online ordering, apps, more takeout, maybe smaller restaurants because people were taking food out, um, the guest experience, things that kind of got lost in the success, if you will. Um, so I'm hearing that over and over again. Have, have you added or are there plans to add any um, technology-based um, solutions or technology, any sort of technology that wasn't there pre-pandemic, apps and things of that nature? Yeah. Yeah. We, um, out of necessity, uh, heading into the, the fall of 2020, we, uh, we realized pretty quickly that we had to be prepared for um, takeout third party and takeout business in a way that we had never done. I mean, it, it was probably 2% of our sales volume pre pandemic. Right. Yep. And, and we, we, um, in September of, of that year, uh, developed family style menu, some take and bake options and got our online ordering up and running in the course of about four weeks yep. in a frantic dash to be ready for when we lost our outdoor seating. Exactly. We, and we saw that shift coming. I let, I, I'm just going to jump in because a lot of folks who listen to this podcast aren't necessarily up here, up in the Northeast. I'm in New York, you're up in New England. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming the bulk of the, your company operations are up in New Hampshire and up in that market up yeah. north. So for those of you who live in Texas and Florida and Arizona um, during 2020, those of us running restaurants up here, we had the luxury of having outdoor seating, which I know a couple of brands that had actually had more seating outside than they ever had inside. But the problem is when September, October rolls around and it starts to get cold, you need to figure it out really fast because people aren't going to sit outside when it's 20 degrees. So yeah. what I'm hearing you say is that your takeout business, being a full service restaurant, this doesn't surprise me, your takeout and or delivery uh, curbside or otherwise was really a de minimis 
percentage of your overall sales. But then you realize, okay, now that it's getting cold, we got to really ramp this thing up because that's got to be a bigger part of our sales because we can't let people in the restaurant and they're not sitting outside in New Hampshire in the wintertime. And you focused on on that. So did you did you do uh, online ordering on through your own POS system? Did you go through third parties, uh, third party platforms, say like uh, Grubhub and Uber Eats? Uh, what was your approach to that? Yeah, we had we had the third party relationships in place um, ahead of this and expanded in some ways. But what we what we needed to add was our own online ordering. That's the piece that was was missing. Um, so we built that out and got it up and running. And yeah, it was first, first you went from, all right, buy all the patio heaters you can. <laughs> and that, and that, bought, you know, that got you through another four to six weeks. And then those were all, those were all sold out. Um, but then, yeah, pretty quickly, we, did, we didn't know exactly where it would go, but you know, we were, we were fortunate in three of the four States that were in with company stores that they allowed on the sale of, of to go margaritas. So we added that into our mix, and that helped a little bit. Um, I, it, you know, there were it was there were uncertain times in December of 2020. You know, we'd had a good summer, felt pretty good, and then we went through to a, to a little bit more. We're under a little bit more pressure than we've been under this winter, but still, yep. it, things tightened up. Yep. And um, we were lucky to have that piece in place. We 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 ran about 20 percent of our business through takeout through the through the the coldest months um and we were also under you know seating restrictions at 50 50 percent capacity or closing early in a lot of areas that's one of the other things that worked to our advantage and it's not necessarily part of the future model but we learned a few things about the size of our restaurants you know we've we have some pretty big restaurants but you know our, our average size is around seven thousand square feet we found out that we shift a chunk to takeout, and then you have 50% capacity. We could do almost as much in business yep, yep, on a yep. Friday night. So the future model can easily easily work at 5,000 square feet. Well, I, again, I, I and I have a brand. We have a brand in our in our FSO portfolio um, that again experienced the exact same thing that you're talking about. They've reduced the size of their footprint, and as a franchise model. What it's done uh, is number one, it's reduced the overall investment cost because you're building out less space. But more importantly, it's reduced the rent load. And I guess ultimately, um, or kind of at the top of the heap, uh, a topic we're all struggling with is labor. It's actually reduced the labor load. So you can have less people in the building. The building is smaller, you're covering less territory. So it addresses a lot of issues. So to kind of tie into the original topic here about things that you've kind of developed out of necessity during the pandemic, but now, hey, they're good ideas we're gonna go forward with. It sounds like the idea of uh, tighter menus, the one day part, the technology driven, the apps, the smaller footprint, perhaps, uh, that those are things that they're not going away. When, when COVID finally goes away, those things will still be an embedded core value inside the, the, the business model of margaritas. Is that an overstatement? Yeah. That, no, that's definitely true. Um, and you know, on, on the footprint, we have almost entirely built this organization on using second generation space and, and being adaptable. And, and that's very quite a bit. Some of our larger restaurants are because we, we bought the property and it, it was a good, too, too good to pass up, but we've got these big restaurants. And while they, they were um, very helpful at 50% spaced out capacity, um, that, that really doesn't seem like the future. And it, it didn't before the pandemic, like you yeah. could see the way competition was working in our markets with a, a lot more um, um, independent locations, running smaller units, taking seats, more seats in, in a lot of in competition in our markets. And, and we already felt, although we weren't talking as much about growth pre-pandemic, we, we did have kind of that shift in mindset already that yep. as, as, we, as we tried to define a model for the franchise side, um, 
it was going to, it was probably going to be a smaller footprint. We're yeah. not, we're not closed off to the doing bigger restaurants like we've done in the right market, but there are advantages that are. Yeah. I, I would, I, I would have to tell you in, in sort of an unscientific survey based on the, I don't know, approaching a hundred programs that I've done and, and hundreds and hundreds of restaurant people that I've spoken with uh, either for Forbes articles that I write or for this program or for other things that I do, it seems there are three things that have been really um, illustrated or highlighted during the pandemic that are common now in terms of what restaurant tours will be doing. And I think they're in this order. order. Um, they've, they've, they've reconsidered their menu. And I put that at the bottom. Above that is they're now, they, they now look hard at technology. And above that is they now look at smaller or flexible footprints because the footprint, you know, the footprint of the restaurant impacts virtually everything. So footprint, technology, and menu. Uh, I keep hearing over and over and over again that if we've learned anything out in, if we've learned anything about our business, and if we've done things to help our business and advance our business as a result of the pandemic of things that will stay, it will be smaller footprint, more technology, tighter menus, more focused menus. That's kind of what I've been hearing over and over and over again. Yep, yep. We're, so, we're on the same page on that. Yeah. So, all right, what's, what's like one last thought you'd like to leave us with uh, about margaritas? And I really have to stop in, as I said, I've driven past one uh, on my way to to the Jersey Shore, but I'm going to stop in for sure. By the way, Mexican cuisine is one of my favorites, um, so I will definitely stop in. But what's the you know what one thought, last thought would you like to leave us with? Well, I think everything that that you you just listed out for us, um, the workforce is is the driver in in our outlook, and we internally. Our conversation is all about being the employer of choice. You know, over 30 years, we have so many people that come back, whether they work for, for margaritas for six months or six years, or we have people who are at 30 years. Um, it, they often say it was the best job they ever had. And it's because the other people they work with. So our outlook is even if we're consolidated on how many people it takes, and we've made some, some changes through technology and, and footprint and menu to improve our labor metrics, um, it's, it's turnover that's the key and, and how we take care of people. And quickly through these uncertain times, we're working on getting back to the things that we did culturally over the years that get, um, keep us at the top of the list from that perspective. You know, that piece I think is gonna be the key um, foundation for our ability to grow internally and and the things we've learned um, that support um, having a tighter model I think really is a good foundation for how we're about to lean into this franchise side of growth and and be a great franchisor so yeah. it's about the people and and how we can create an environment where they're successful and efficient and and we can have fun doing what we do. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, um, finding real estate, deploying capital, that's black and white, that's not that, it's not that difficult. Developing a great team, retaining that great team, motivating that great team, that's what makes great companies. So on that note, I guess we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, Bob, if somebody wants to know more about Margaritas or they wanna reach the company, what's the best way, website, what, how do they reach you? Yeah, website is uh, margs.com, M-A-R-G-S.com. And uh, Gary, you can put my email address, bray at margs.com okay. um, in the show notes too. And uh, yeah, be happy to hear from anybody. Yeah, and, and, and for those of you listening, as you know, if you're a regular listener, we always list that down in the, in the show notes, down in the profile on the program. So you'll be able to reach out to Bob. You'll be able to uh, learn more about the company. Bob, thank you so much for being with us today. I truly appreciate your time. Uh, this has been fun. Um, as I said, you know, Mexican food, margaritas, you know, that's, that's my thing. I love it. 
Um, this has been very insightful and I, I appreciate you sharing your journey of kind of jumping into the hot seat, the operations seat uh, in March of 2020. I mean, can't imagine, can't imagine dropping into a forest fire in any in any better way than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been it's been something else, but yeah. still we're having fun. Great, thank you very much. And uh, for those of you who are our followers, please uh, always like, comment, and share when you see this on LinkedIn, and uh, be sure to follow more episodes. Have a great day. Thanks, Gary.